Welcome to a fireside reading of A Passage to India by E. M. Forster, Chapter 2. Abandoning his bicycle, which fell before a servant could catch it, the young man sprang up onto the veranda. He was all animation. Hamidullah! Hamidullah! Am I late? he cried. Do not apologize, said his host. You are always late. Kindly answer my question. Am I late? Has Mahmud Ali eaten all the food? If so, I shall go elsewhere. Mr. Mahmud Ali, how are you? Thank you, Dr. Aziz. I am dying. Dying before your dinner? Oh, poor Mahmud Ali. Hamidullah here is actually dead. He passed away just as you rode up on your bike. Yes, that is so, said the other. Imagine us both as addressing you from another and a happier world. Does there happen to be such a thing as a hookah in that happier world of yours? Aziz, don't chatter. We are having a very sad talk. The hookah had been packed too tight, as was usual in his friend's house, and bubbled sulkily. He coaxed it, yielding at last. The tobacco jetted up into his lungs and nostrils, driving out the smoke of burning cow dung that had filled them as he rode through the bazaar. It was delicious. He lay in a trance, sensuous but healthy, through which the talk of the two others did not seem particularly sad. They were discussing as to whether or no it is possible to be friends with an Englishman. Mahmoud Ali argued that it was not. Hamidullah disagreed, but with so many reservations that there was no friction between them. Delicious indeed to lie on the broad veranda with the moon rising in front and the servants preparing dinner behind and no trouble happening. Well, look at my own experience this morning. I only contend that it is possible in England replied Hamidullah, who had been to that country long ago, before the big rush, and had received a cordial welcome at Cambridge. It is impossible here, Aziz. The red-nosed boy has again insulted me in court. I do not blame him. He was told that he ought to insult me. Until lately he was quite a nice boy, but the others have got hold of him. Yes, they have no chance here. That is my point. They come out intending to be gentlemen and are told it will not do. Look at Leslie. Look at Blakiston. Now it is your red-nosed boy, and Fielding will go next. Why, I remember when Turton came out first. It was in another part of the province. You fellows will not believe me, but I have driven with Turton in his carriage. Turton! Oh, yes, we were once quite intimate. He has shown me his stamp collection. He would expect you to steal it now, Turton, but Red-Nosed Boy will be far worse than Turton. I do not think so. They all become exactly the same, not worse, not better. I give any Englishman two years, be he Turton or Burton. It is only the difference of a letter. And I give any Englishwoman six months. All are exactly alike. Do you not agree with me? I do not, replied Mahmoud Ali, entering into the bitter fun and feeling both pain and amusement at each word that was uttered. For my own part... I find such profound differences among our rulers. Red nose mumbles. Turton talks distinctly. Mrs. Turton takes bribes. Mrs. Red nose does not and cannot, because so far there is no Mr. Red nose. Bribes? 
Did you not know that when they were lent to central India over a canal scheme, some Raja or other gave her a sewing machine in solid gold so that the water should run through his state? And does it? No, that is where Mrs. Turton is so skilful. When we poor blacks take bribes, we perform what we are bribed to perform, and the Lord discovers us in consequence. The English take and do nothing. I admire them. We all admire them, Aziz. Please, pass me the hooker. Oh, not now. Hooker is so jolly now. You are a very selfish boy. He raised his voice suddenly and shouted for dinner. Servants shouted back that it was ready. They meant that they wished it was ready and were so understood, for nobody moved. Then Hamidullah continued, but with changed manner and evident emotion. But take my case, the case of young Hugh Bannister. Here is the son of my dear my dead friends, the Reverend and Mrs. Bannister, whose goodness to me in England I shall never forget or describe. They were father and mother to me. I talked to them as I do now. In the vacations their rectory became my home. They entrusted all their children to me. I often carried little Hugh about. I took him up to the funeral of Queen Victoria, and held him in my arms above the crowd. Queen Victoria was different, murmured Mahmoud Ali. I learn now that this boy is in business as a leather merchant at Cornpore. Imagine how I long to see him and to pass his fare that this house may be his home. But it is useless. The other Anglo-Indians will have got hold of him long ago. He will probably think that I want something, and I cannot face that from the son of my old friends. Oh, what in this country has gone wrong with everything, Vakil Sahib? I ask you. Aziz joined in. Why talk about the English? Brr. Why be either friends with the fellows or not friends? Let us shut them out and be jolly. Queen Victoria and Mrs. Bannister were the only exceptions, and they're dead. No, no, I do not admit that. I have met others. So have I, said Mahmoud Ali, unexpectedly veering. All ladies are far from alike. Their mood was changed, and they recalled little kindnesses and courtesies. She said, thank you so much in the most natural way. She offered me a lozenge when the dust irritated my throat. Hamidullah could remember more important examples of angelic ministration. But the other, who only knew Anglo-India, had to ransack his memory for scraps, and it was not surprising that he should return to but of course all this is exceptional. The exception does not prove the rule. The average woman is like Mrs. Turton, and Aziz, you know what she is. Aziz did not know, but said he did. He too generalized from his disappointments. It's difficult for members of a subject race to do otherwise. Granted the exceptions, he agreed that all English women are haughty and venal. The gleam passed from the conversation, whose wintry surface unrolled and expanded interminably. A servant announced dinner. They ignored him. The elder men had reached their eternal politics. Aziz drifted into the garden. The trees smelt sweet, green-blossomed champak and scraps of Persian poetry came into his head. Dinner, dinner, dinner. 
But when he returned to the house for it, Mahmoud Ali had drifted away in his turn to speak to his size. Come and see my wife a little then, said Hamidullah, and they spent twenty minutes behind the poda. Hamidullah Begum was a distant aunt of Aziz and the only female relative he had in Chandrapur, and she had much to say to him on this occasion about a family circumcision that had been celebrated with imperfect pomp. It was difficult to get away, because until they had had their dinner, she would not begin hers, and consequently prolonged her remarks in case they should suppose she was impatient. Having censured the circumcision, she bethought her of kindred topics, and asked Aziz when he was going to be married. Respectful but irritated, he answered, Once is enough. Yes, he has done his duty, said Hamidullah. Do not tease him so. He carries on his family, two boys, and their sister. Aunt, they live most comfortably with my wife's mother, where she was living when she died. I can see them whenever I like. They are such very, very small children. And he sends them the whole of his salary and lives like a low-grade clerk and tells no one the reason. What more do you require him to do? But this was not Hamidullah Begum's point, and having courteously changed the conversation for a few moments, she returned and made it. She said, what is to become of all our daughters if men refuse to marry? They will marry beneath them, or... And she began the oft-told tale of a lady of imperial descent who could find no husband in the narrow circle where her pride permitted her to mate and had lived on unwed, her age now thirty, and would die unwed, for no one would have her now. While the tale was in progress, it convinced the two men the tragedy seemed a slur on the whole community, better polygamy almost than that a woman should die without the joys God has intended her to receive, wedlock, motherhood, power in the house. For what else is she born and how can the man who has denied them to her stand up to face her creator and his own at the last day? Aziz took his leave, saying, Oh, perhaps, but later, his invariable reply to such an appeal. You mustn't put off what you think right, said Hamidullah. That is why India is in such a plight because we put off things. But seeing that his young relative looked worried, he added a few soothing words, and thus wiped out any impression that his wife might have made. During their absence, Mahmoud Ali had gone off in his carriage, leaving a message that he should be back in five minutes, but they were on no account to wait. They sat down to meet with a distant cousin of the house, Mohammed Latif, who lived on Hamidullah's bounty and who occupied the position neither of a servant nor of an equal. He did not speak unless spoken to, and since no one spoke, kept unoffended silence. Now and then he belched in compliment to the richness of the food. A gentle, happy and dishonest old man. All his life he had never done a stroke of work. So long as some one of his relatives had a house, he was sure of a home, and it was unlikely that so large a family would all go bankrupt. His wife led a similar existence, some hundreds of miles away. He did not visit her, owing to the expense of the railway ticket. Presently, Aziz chaffed him, also the servants, and then began quoting poetry, Persian, Urdu, a little Arabic. His memory was good, and for so young a man he'd read largely. The themes he preferred were the decay of Islam and the brevity of love. They listened, delighted, for they took the public view of poetry 
not the private which obtains in England. It never bored them to hear words, words. They breathed them with the cool night air, never stopping to analyse. The name of the poet, Hafiz, Hali, Iqbal, was sufficient guarantee. India, a hundred Indias whispered outside, beneath the indifferent moon. But for the time, India seemed one and their own, and they regained their departed greatness by hearing its departure lamented. They felt young again, because reminded that youth must fly. A servant in scarlet interrupted him. He was the chuprasi of the civil surgeon, and he handed Aziz a note. Old Calendar wants to see me at his bungalow, he said, not rising. He might have the politeness to say why. Some case, I dare say. I dare say not. I dare say nothing. He has found out our dinner hour, that's all, and chooses to interrupt us every time in order to show his power. On the one hand, he always does this. On the other, it may be a serious case, and you cannot know, said Hamidullah, considerately paving the way towards obedience. Had you not better clean your teeth after pun? If my teeth are to be cleaned, I don't go at all. I am an Indian. It is an Indian habit to take pun. The civil surgeon must put up with it. Mohammed Latif, my bike, please. The poor relation got up, slightly immersed in the realms of matter. He laid his hand on the bicycle's saddle while the servant did the actual wheeling. Between them, they took it over a tin tack. As he held his hands under the ewer, dried them, fitted on his green felt hat, and then, with unexpected energy, whizzed out of Hamidullah's compound. Aziz, Aziz, imprudent boy. But he was far down the bazaar, riding furiously. He had neither light nor bell, nor had he a break. But what use are such adjuncts in a land where the cyclist's only hope is to coast from face to face, and just before he collides with each, it vanishes. And the city was fairly empty at this hour. When his tyre went flat, he leaped off and shouted for a tonga. He did not at first find one, and he had also to dispose of his bicycle at a friend's house. He dallied, furthermore, to clean his teeth. But at last he was rattling towards the civil lines with a vivid sense of speed. As he entered their arid tidiness, Depression suddenly seized him. The roads, named after victorious generals and intersecting at right angles, were symbolic of the net Great Britain had thrown over India. He felt caught in their meshes. When he turned into Major Callender's compound, he could with difficulty restrain himself from getting down from the Tonga and approaching the bungalow on foot, and this was not because his soul was servile, but because his feelings, the sensitive edges of him, feared a gross snub. There had been a case last year. An Indian gentleman had driven up to an official's house and been turned back by the servants and been told to approach more suitably. Only one case among thousands of visits to hundreds of officials, but its fame spread wide. The young man shrunk from a repetition of it. He compromised and stopped the driver just outside the flood of light that fell across the veranda. The civil surgeon was out. But the sahib has left me some message. The servant returned an indifferent, No. Aziz was in despair. It was a servant whom he had forgotten to tip and he could do nothing now because there were people in the hall. He was convinced that there was a message and that the man was withholding it out of revenge. 
While they argued, the people came out. Both were ladies. Aziz lifted his hat. The first, who was in evening dress, glanced at the Indian and turned instinctively away. Mrs. Leslie, it is a Tonga, she cried. Ours? inquired the second, also seeing Aziz and doing likewise. Take the gifts the god provides us, anyhow, she screeched, and both jumped in. O oh, Tonga Walla, club, club, why doesn't the fool go? Go, I will pay you tomorrow, said Aziz to the driver, and as they went off he called courteously. You are most welcome, ladies. They did not reply, being full of their own affairs. So it had come, the usual thing, just as Mahmoud Ali said, the inevitable snub. His bow ignored his carriage taken. It might have been worse, for it comforted him somehow that Madame Callender and Leslie should both be fat and weigh the Tonga down behind. Beautiful women would have pained him. He turned to the servant, gave him a couple of rupees, and asked again whether there was a message. The man, now very civil, returned the same answer. Major Callender had driven away half an hour before. Saying nothing? He had, as a matter of fact, said, Damn, Aziz! Words that the servant understood, but was too polite to repeat. One can tip too much, as well as too little. Indeed, the coin that buys the exact truth has not yet been minted. Then I will write him a letter. He was offered the use of the house, but was too dignified to enter it. Paper and ink were brought onto the veranda. He began, Dear Sir, at your express command I have hastened, as a subordinate should, and then stopped. Tell him I have called. That is sufficient, he said, tearing the protest up. Here is my card. Call me a Tonga. Huzoor, all are at the club. Then telephone for one down at the railway station. And since the man hastened to do this, he said, Enough, enough. I prefer to walk. He commandeered a match and lit a cigarette. These attentions, though purchased, soothed him. They would last as long as he had rupees, which is something. But to shake the dust of Anglo-India off his feet, to escape from the net and be back among manners and gestures that he knew, he began a walk, an unwanted exercise. He was an athletic little man, daintily put together, but really very strong. Nevertheless, walking fatigued him, as it fatigues everyone in India except the newcomer. There is something hostile in that soil. It either yields and the foot sinks into a depression, or else it's unexpectedly rigid and sharp, pressing stones or crystals against the tread. The series of these little surprises exhausts, and he was wearing pumps, a poor preparation for any country. At the edge of the civil station, he turned into a mosque to rest. He had always liked this mosque. It was gracious, and the arrangement pleased him. The courtyard, entered through a ruined gate, contained an ablution tank of fresh, clear water, which was always in motion, indeed being part of a conduit that supplied the city. The courtyard was paved with broken slabs, the covered part of the mosque was deeper than is usual. Its effect was that of an English parish church, whose side has been taken out. Where he sat, he looked into three arcades, whose darkness was illuminated by a small hanging lamp and by the moon. The front, in full moonlight, had the appearance of marble, and the ninety-nine names of God on the frieze stood out black as the frieze stood out white against the sky. The contest between the dualism and the contention of shadows within pleased Aziz. 
and he tried to symbolize the whole into some truth of religion or love. A mosque, by winning his approval, let loose his imagination. The temple of another creed, Hindu, Christian or Greek, would have bored him and failed to awaken his sense of beauty. Here was Islam, his own country, more than a faith, more than a battle cry, more, much more. Islam, an attitude towards life, both exquisite and durable, where his body and his thoughts found their home. His seat was the low wall that bounded the courtyard on the left. The ground fell away beneath him towards the city, visible as a blur of trees, and in the stillness he heard many small sounds. On the right, over in the club, the English community contributed an amateur orchestra. Elsewhere, some Hindus were drumming. He knew they were Hindus because the rhythm was uncongenial to him, and others were bewailing a corpse. He knew Foos, having certified it in the afternoon. There were owls, the Punjab mail, the flowers smelt deliciously in the station master's garden, but the mosque, that alone signified, and he returned to it from the complex appeal of the night, and decked it with meanings the builder had never intended. Some day he too would build a mosque, smaller than this, but in perfect taste, so that all who passed by should experience the happiness he felt now. And near it, under a low dome, should be his tomb with a Persian inscription. Alas, without me for thousands of years, the rose will blossom and the spring will bloom. But those who have secretly understood my heart, they will approach and visit the grave where I lie. He had seen the quatrain on the tomb of a Deccan king and regarded it as profound philosophy. He always held pathos to be profound, the secret understanding of the heart. He repeated the phrase with tears in his eyes. And as he did so, one of the pillars of the mosque seemed to quiver. It swayed in the gloom and detached itself. Belief in ghosts ran in his blood, but he sat firm. Another pillar moved, a third, and then an English woman stepped out into the moonlight. Suddenly he was furiously angry and shouted, Madam! 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 Oh! Oh! The woman gasped. Madam, this is a mosque. You have no right here at all. You should have taken off your shoes. This is a holy place for Muslims. I have taken them off. You have? I left them at the entrance. Then I ask your pardon. Still startled, the woman moved out, keeping the ablution tank between them. He called after her. I am truly sorry for speaking. Yes, I, I was right, was I not? If I remove my shoes, I am allowed? Of course. But so few ladies take the trouble, especially if thinking no one is there to see. That makes no difference. God is here. Madam, please let me go. Oh, can I do you some service now or at any time? No, thank you, really. None. Good night. May I know your name? She was now in the shadow of the gateway so that he could not see her face, but she saw his, and she said with a change of voice, Mrs. Moore. Mrs. Advancing, he found that she was old. A fabric bigger than the mosque 
fell to pieces, and he did not know whether he was glad or sorry. She was older than Hamidullah Begum, with a red face and white hair. Her voice had deceived him. Mrs. Moore, I am afraid I startled you. I shall tell my community, our friends, about you, that God is here. <laughs> very good, very fine indeed. I think you are newly arrived in India. Yes. How did you know? By the way you address me. No, but can I call you a carriage? I have only come from the club. They are doing a play that I have seen in London, and it was so hot. What was the name of the play? Cousin Kate. I think you ought not to walk at night alone, Mrs. Moore. There are bad characters about, and leopards may come across from the Maribar Hills. Snakes also, she exclaimed. She had forgotten the snakes. For example... A six-spot beetle, he continued. You pick it up, it bites, you die. But you walk about yourself. Oh, I am used to it. Used to snakes? They both laughed. I'm a doctor, he said. Snakes don't dare bite me. They sat down side by side in the entrance and slipped on their evening shoes. Please... May I ask you a question now? Why do you come to India at this time of year, just as the cold weather is ending? I intended to start earlier, but there was an unavoidable delay. It will soon be so unhealthy for you. And why ever do you come to Chandrapur? To visit my son. He is the city magistrate here. Oh, no. Excuse me, that is quite impossible. Our city magistrate's name is Mr. Heeslop. I know him intimately. He's my son all the same, she said, smiling. But Mrs. Moore, how can he be? I was married twice. Yes, now I see. And your first husband died. He did. And so did my second husband. Then we are in the same box, he said cryptically. Then is the city magistrate the entire of your family now? No, there are the younger ones, Ralph and Stella, in England. And the gentleman here, is he Ralph and Stella's half-brother? Quite right. Mrs. Moore, this is all extremely strange, because... Like yourself, I have also two sons and a daughter. Is not this the same box with a vengeance? What are their names? Not also Ronnie, Ralph and Stella, surely? The suggestion delighted him. No, indeed. How funny it sounds. Their names are quite different and will surprise you. Listen, please. I am about to tell you my children's names. The first is called Ahmed, the second is called Karim, the third, she is the eldest, Jamila. Three children are enough. Do you not agree with me? I do. They were both silent for a little, thinking of their respective families. She sighed and rose to go. Would you care to see over the Minto Hospital one morning? he inquired. I have nothing else to offer at Chandrapur. Thank you. I have seen it already, or I should have liked to come with you very much. I suppose the civil surgeon took you? Yes, and Mrs. Callender. His voice altered. Ah, a very charming lady. Possibly, when one knows her better. What? What? You didn't like her? She was certainly intending to be kind, but I did not find her exactly charming. He burst out with, She has just taken my tonga without my permission. <laughs> Do you call that being charming? 
and Major Calendar interrupts me night after night from where I am dining with my friends, and I go at once, breaking up a most pleasant entertainment, and he's not there, and not even a message. Is this charming prey? But what does it matter? I can do nothing, and he knows it. I am just a subordinate. My time is of no value. The veranda is good enough for an Indian. Yes, yes, let him stand. And Mrs. Callender takes my carriage and cuts me dead. She listened. He was excited partly by his wrongs, but much more by the knowledge that someone sympathised with them. It was this that led him to repeat, exaggerate, contradict. She had proved her sympathy by criticising her fellow countrywoman to him, but even earlier he had known. The flame that not even beauty can nourish was springing up, and though his words were querulous, his heart began to glow secretly. Presently it burst into speech. You understand me. You know what others feel. Oh, if others resembled you. Rather surprised, she replied, Oh, I don't think I understand people very well. I only know whether I like or dislike them. Then you are an Oriental. She accepted his escort back to the club and said at the gate that she wished she was a member so that she could have asked him in. Indians are not allowed into the Chandrapur club, even as guests, he said simply. He did not expatiate on his wrongs now, being happy. As he strolled downhill beneath the lovely moon, and again saw the lovely mosque, he seemed to own the land as much as anyone owned it. What did it matter if a few flabby Hindus had preceded him there, and a few chilly English succeeded. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. More tomorrow, same time and place, uh, at Fireside Reading on Instagram, live at five, and I will be reading thereafter. Uh, there is a possibility that I might not read on Friday or Saturday, but we will see about that. I'll tell you all tomorrow. All right. Thanks again. Uh, I hope you're all very well, and I hope you will stay very well until next time we see one another. Until then, good night. <laughs>